gathering of local heroes have come to town. That's this week on Motoring 2000. SN's Motoring 2000 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. Fire trucks, ambulances, and more fire trucks. In fact, it's the largest gathering of emergency vehicles anywhere in this country. Hello, everyone. I know what you're saying. You're saying, what are we doing here? I thought this was a program about cars and the people who drive them. Well, it is. But if you've been watching motoring since 1988, you know that if it's got wheels, we'll be there. And you know, today's firefighter is probably responding to more car crashes than actual fires. And many times, they're the difference between life and death. But you know, there's another reason we're here. I've been chasing fire trucks my entire life. In fact, these men and women are my heroes, and I know I'm not alone. Anyway, sit back as we visit what is known as a firefighter's muster. Well, a muster is a gathering, a uh, gathering of anything. So in this case, it's a gathering of fire trucks, ambulances, and police vehicles from across Ontario. There's a long history of musters. Musters uh, started in the 19th century when firemen got together and held community celebrations. Uh, the muster here at Dune Heritage Crossroads is eight years old. Well, we have fire trucks, police vehicles, and ambulances from across Ontario, right through southwestern Ontario, Toronto, and into eastern Ontario as well. Uh, we also have uh, teams here from across Ontario who will be competing in firefighter games all day long. And uh, just a lot of great other things going on for fun family activities and fire safety messages. Uh, you're looking at a 1954 Packard Henny Ambulance. Um, it was uh, found and uh, completely looked after about 20 years ago. Rebuilt, body, interior, everything else. In 1954, Toronto Ambulance had two of them. It was run uh, the morgue and ambulance service combined. Um, it's very rare. There's just over 200 of them built originally. I don't know how many are left right now. I've only seen the one. Under the hood we have a 359 cubic inch Thunderbolt engine, flathead 8. We have done some recent work on it with some carburation and things like that. We had an electronic fuel pump on it. We switched that back to a manual. Works much better. It's a 6 volt system. The uh, air filter is somewhat different than the newer cars. It has an oil bath filter on it. You just take this everything apart clean out the uh, pan itself and pour in some more oil, put it back together, collects the dust. Our department rebuilt the engine, the mechanics did a beautiful job. It drove from the city of Toronto here, 100 kilometers an hour, just like a dream. Floats down the highway, reliable, starts every time for me. Uh, just a beautiful vehicle. This is one of my favorite uh, annual fire apparatus musters, the first one on the trail in Canada. They've got a wonderful variety of uh, apparatus here today from hand tubs built 100 years ago up to very, very modern 2000 model rigs. But every show has its stars, of course, and the hands down beauty queen here this year is this one. A 1935 American La France model 412 RB, uh, 1250 gallon per minute pumper. This is among the most desirable and most spectacular of antique fire engines. Uh, only three of these ever built in Canada or used in Canada. Vancouver had one, Rouen, Noranda had one, and Timmins, Ontario had one. What makes this really unique is the uh, powertrain in it. This is a uh, 
240 horsepower V12 engine that was designed and built by America and France, introduced in 1931 and actually produced up into the early 60s. Uh, it is attached to a 1250 gallon per minute pump, very short coupled here. What makes this unique among fire engines is the fact that the pump is mounted right in the cowl, uh, very close coupled. Uh, these were very these were big city fire engines, 1,000, 1,250, and 1,500 gallon per minute pumps. Los Angeles had a fleet of these. And this is how it was in the early 1800s. They could have lost a building, and this is how the firefighting took place. Uh, certainly for the firemen, it's uh, it's a showcase. They want to show off their fire truck. I think for the general public who come in, they walk in and say, wow, look at all these fire trucks. Um, this is amazing because you won't see any more fire trucks, police vehicles, and ambulances uh, than here in Canada this year. Where are you going? To go driving. We're going to the fire. To the fire. Hey kids, if you want to get to that fire in one piece, well, Aren't you forgetting something? More on that later on Kenzie's Corner. So the question is, is it a sport utility vehicle or is it a pickup truck? According to Ford, the answer is yes, as they've married the front end of an Explorer to the back end of a pickup truck to create the all-new 2001 Sport Track. Sport Track comes suspended on a double wishbone design up front and two-stage leaf springs in back. During the pylon test, the soft settings and 255-70R16 all-terrain tires delivered a lot of body roll and quite a lot of tire screech. That said, it's nothing to get overly worked up about. The response to input remains reasonably crisp and the rack and pinion steering has a decent on centre feel. Off-road, the supple nature of the suspension and the chassis that's 40% stiffer than a stock Explorer soaks up the bumps in a comfortable and compliant manner. Considering Sport Track's split personality, the compromise between on and off-road performance, well, it's a good one. The Sport Track comes with a 51 inch box, which is really only long enough to go and get gardening supplies and the like. However, Ford thought of everything. Drop the tailgate down and flip this little fence out. Now you've extended the bed by about two feet, making it long enough to accommodate bikes. So what happens if you've got five people inside? Where do you keep your valuables? You certainly don't want to leave them out here. Well, Ford have addressed that as well. You simply order the hard top tonneau cover, which is lockable, the tailgate's lockable. Now you've got somewhere fairly secure to keep all your valuables. Stopping power is delivered by a front disc rear drum design that comes with standard anti-lock. The pedal feel is crisp and easily modulated. While the front bumper resists the urge to kiss the tarmac, nosedive is an issue, and again because of the soft suspension. For the record, the Sport Track required 118 feet to stop for 80k. The 4-liter single overhead cam V6 serves as the motivational power. The two-valve design delivers 205 horsepower and a very useful 238 pounds-feet of torque at just 3,000 RPM. This gives Sport Track solid off-the-line pickup as well as a good turn of speed when it comes time to merge with faster-moving traffic. It also delivers a 5,300-pound towing capacity when properly equipped. You know, there are a couple of items that separate the Sport Track from a conventional pickup truck. First of all, access to the rear seat, well, it's very easy. And when you get back here, it's surprisingly comfortable. And that's primarily because the seat back, well, it's not bolt upright. If you need to carry cargo back here, again, not a problem. Simply fold the seat forward. You've now got a nice flat carpeted surface. The other area I do like, there's proper child tether anchors in the back, three of them to be precise, so you can put a child seat in properly. The other thing, the back glass, well, it powers down to allow you to carry longer items in the cab. Before going off-road, you might want to switch into four-wheel drive, and on this sport track, it's that simple. Off-road, the torque makes easy work of the steep bits, especially if you select four low. The added bonus is that the motor is clean enough to meet low emission standards, meaning you don't leave needless amounts of pollution in your wake. Inside the Sport Track, 
well, it comes pretty well loaded. You get power locks, windows, mirrors, a very contemporary set of white face gauges and a wonderful sounding stereo. You also get an overhead console which gives you temperature readout and a compass. There's also enough storage space to satisfy anybody's needs, up to and including, well, the center console doubles as this very neat little tote bag. The one thing that doesn't please, however, all the carpeting is rubber. Now, who in their right mind is going to hose out an upscale vehicle? It just detracts from an otherwise very nice interior. Ford uses a very clever electronic sleight of hand to deliver a five-speed automatic transmission. Rather than putting in five different speeds, they lock the torque converter in first gear. As a result, you go from first to first lock, to second to third, and so on, to fourth lock or overdrive. The result is a seamless transition between gears, one that not only maximizes the engine's sweetness, it rivals anything offered. Later in the year, a five-speed manual will be offered. While a fan of do-it-yourself shifting, I'm not sure why anyone would want this in an off-road oriented vehicle. You know, there are some people that are going to mistake the sport track as a pickup truck with a very short box. However, there is a much larger group that are going to get it and appreciate the fact that this vehicle offers a nice, large, comfortable space for the passengers and a spot out the back here for your dirty junk. I mean, after all, where would you rather throw a couple of dirty mountain bikes? Inside your SUV? Or in the back of this sport track? Our Midas tip of the week concerns head restraints. When you're in and out of as many vehicles as I am in a day, you need to adjust a lot of things. Obviously, seat position, seat belts, mirrors, etc., to make yourself comfortable and safe in the vehicle. But one thing a lot of us overlook, and I know I've been guilty of this, is adjusting the head restraint. Now, this is my own vehicle, and you can see that if I get rear-ended right now with the head restraint adjusted all the way to the bottom, my head is going to whip back and I'm probably going to have some whiplash injuries to my neck and that's a bad type of injury. We all know that the most common type of accident is the rear ender. So you can see that my head is unsupported if I get rear ended. Now if I reach around and bring the head restraint to its full height adjustment, you can see that now if I get rear ended, I've got support for my head. In most cases that's going to prevent or lessen the severity of neck injuries that might occur. Make sure that you're checking this on a regular basis. When you go from one vehicle to another, don't forget to adjust that head restraint, a major safety feature that a lot of us are overlooking. That's your Midas tip of the week. I got involved in uh, my enthusiasm for Porsches and uh, gosh, around 1960, I suppose, and uh, as soon as I could, uh, Pretty much, I bought one. And so the love affair began between Dan Proudfoot and his 1963 356, the first vehicle to carry a Porsche nameplate, and one of only 70,000 ever built. I loved Volkswagens as a kid, and then uh, imagine uh, the pleasure of discovering that the man who designed the Volkswagen uh, was also responsible, or his people at least, were responsible for it. A supercar and uh, what caught my imagination first of all they look great to my mind they look better than any other car but also they were incredibly efficient and I thought it was remarkable that this car could go 80 miles per hour and get 30 miles per gallon so I thought that this this was a car that had everything it had looks it had efficiency it had comfort uh, a true grand touring car in the Canadian newspaper business Proudfoot is a household name while Dan writes for the Toronto Sun, his brother Jim is one of Canada's most respected sports columnists. Uh, one thing we can agree on, he didn't influence me in cars because uh, brother Jim has never driven and uh, has no interest in cars. With me, I, I think my dad's enthusiasm for cars rubbed off and that's where it started. But uh, with my brother as the model, Jim is 12 years older than me and his career as a sports writer was uh, coming right along when I was a teenager, and uh, these were things that interested me too, so it certainly was a model for me. The only thing wrong with the driver's source, uh, in my opinion, is we should have done it years earlier. It's, uh, it's a section every Sunday. Uh, we've had uh, car reviews uh, that I've done since 78, uh, so it goes way back, but uh, it was just a page in the paper, and now we have a proper section. 
Uh, it's very good for news and what's going on in the industry, and of course uh, the reviews are uh, the finest. This is the only new car I, I ever bought, actually. I got it as soon as I got a job at the Toronto Telegram back in 66, and uh, liked it. And however, within two years it was showing rust, and I thought, uh, what's the point? I never got another new car after that. I traded it in on the Porsche, which uh, I thought was a fantastic move at the time. I was 24 years old and uh, quite a few pounds uh, lighter, as you can see. Here's what I like about this car. I'm, here's what I love about this particular body. Uh, it was made in a way that cars aren't made anymore, and that brings home the fact that it's sculpture as much as uh, car design to me. Uh, I really think cars are a form of sculpture, but especially a car like, like this, where you, you don't see any seams as you do in new cars or even in a new uh, Porsche 911. But in this car, there's lead. It's leaded in a way that probably wouldn't be legal these days. It, it, would, uh, it would not be good for the workers, but you see just a flow of metal as in a piece of sculpture. And now for the good and bad news. The good news is that Dan has a new house. The bad news, the 356 is up for sale. I remember Jackie Stewart when he was a bit of a hero of mine. I remember reading in his book that how he had to trade in his bicycle to get his first shotgun for uh, skeet shooting. And the, the lesson he learned was that you have to let everything go at some point to get something else. And, Maybe I'm only learning that lesson now. You're looking at Bill Gardner's pickup truck after his accident. Now, thankfully, Billy wasn't seriously hurt, but Bill, I'm willing to bet that the first people at the scene were the firefighters, right? Uh, Brad, around my area, the first people at an accident scene are the tow truck drivers, usually half a dozen of them, and they actually cause a problem for the uh, firefighters. They they clog the scene and make it difficult for the firefighters to get the truck up close to extricate people in some cases. So you tow truck guys hang back a little bit and you'll get along better with those firefighters. Anyhow, uh, what I want to talk about this week is uh, some email we've got here from one of our viewers, Larry Holloway. He's got a 2000 Honda CRV Sport Utility. It's brand new, of course, and he's talking about uh, using synthetic motor oil. He says, I was wondering about using synthetic motor oil in my first oil change. I live up north where the temperature gets very low. I thought the synthetic oil would help my CRV during the cold winter months. It certainly will. I've heard rumors about using synthetic oil and it harming engine seals and that once I switch to synthetic oil, I can't go back to conventional oil. I wanted to know what you thought. Well, I'm a great believer in synthetic motor oil, sir. I used them for a long time. I use synthetic in my Honda uh, Civic Si and in my Chevy pickup truck. I find it works really well and it performs better than conventional motor oil in every measured category. But it's really, really great for extreme low temperature performance. As a matter of fact, extremes of the temperature uh, scale at either end. It's great for extremely hot engines in the summertime, uh, much higher flash point than conventional motor oils, and a much lower pour point. Uh, for example, synthetic motor oil will still pour at minus 50 degrees. So uh, there is some incredible advantages to be had by using synthetic motor oil, especially, for example, in Western Canada where you get lots of cold weather. Now, <clears throat> as far as changing and harming your engine seals, if you've got an older vehicle, obviously not the problem with this 2000 CRV, but if you've got an older vehicle that's got some leaking engine oil seals, the leaks will get worse with synthetic. So you've got to fix the leaks first before you switch over. Not going to be a problem here with a late model vehicle like this or any vehicle that's presently not leaking oil. It's not going to harm the seals. Now as far as changing back to conventional oil, that wouldn't be a problem either, but the benefits of synthetic are so significant, you're not going to want to change back, believe me. Now we've also got some other synthetic products. Grease is a perfect example. We've been using synthetic grease in the shop for quite some time. We find, for example, that we get double the life out of universal joints when we lubricate them with synthetic grease. And when you factor in the, the cost of replacing those parts when they wear out prematurely, using synthetics is well worth it. Now the lubricants themselves are more expensive, but the uh, benefits are well worth the extra cost. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2000. If you're big into cars, check out MotoringTV.com and while you're at it, download a copy of Autopilot. Autopilot software searches out the matches to your automotive interest and makes the most of your online time.
I don't get mad very often, or really I don't. But one thing that makes me really angry is to see mom and dad driving down the street with their seat belts on and Junior standing on the center console. I mean, one tap of the brakes, boom, he's a hood ornament on a Mack truck. Now, the worst I ever saw was a guy, presumably dad, driving down a main street in Toronto with his kid on his lap. The baby is airbag. What a concept. What's wrong with these people? Don't they read? Don't they think? Put your kids in a car seat for crying out loud. And don't give me that crap that they won't sit still, they'll be whining and fussing. I raised four kids, the youngest is 13. They haven't gone 10 feet without being in an appropriate car seat, so don't tell me it can't be done. Now, even you folks who are putting your kids in car seats, don't feel too smug about that, because a recent survey showed that over half of all car seats, the kid isn't properly fitted. Either the seat's wrong for his height and weight, the belt isn't properly attached, there's no tether strap, or there's something else wrong with it. Find out how to put your car seat in correctly. The CAA has clinics all over the country. Most car dealerships have clinics all over the place. Because let's face it, we get properly outraged when somebody beats a poor child to death. But compared to car crashes, that's not even an issue. We kill more people, kids in car crashes, than any other cause. Now, Brad met a police officer the other day who said that's one of his favorite things to do, is to spot somebody who doesn't have the kid properly restrained, throws the lights on, pulls them over, and runs them. Now, police officers all across this country heed that advice. You're going to save a whole lot more lives doing that than sitting in some fishing hole with a radar gun. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, the firefighters muster is still underway here in Kitchener, Ontario, but we've got to go. But before we do, many of the firefighters have asked me to extend an invitation to everybody across the country, no matter where you are, as long as they're not attending a fire, they'd love you to drop by the local fire hall and they'd be more than happy to give you a tour. And that's one invitation I won't refuse. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive. TSN's Motoring 2000 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.